And I got to know Steve when he was a graduate student at Harvard, and he used to hang out some at MIT with the, the, what, what I sometimes call the vicious circle of uh, <laughs> Fodor and Block and uh, uh, various other MIT people uh, that we had this little uh, discussion group. Uh, and uh, Ruth was a, uh, a visitor at one point, and uh, I don't think anybody else in the room was, uh, was a visitor, was, had a paper or a book discussed at that group, but uh, Steve was part of that gang too. Thank you. Uh, I'm taking seriously Dan's charge to present new ideas that I've, uh, uh, that we've been uh, mulling over, thinking, trying to formulate, uh, including ones that, that may be uh, controversial, not fully worked out. Uh, and I'm going to share with you an idea that I know on the basis of experience is uh, deeply upsetting to many people. Uh, for many people, they are enraged to hear it. it uh, they are saddened. It drains their life of all meaning and purpose. And that is the, the idea that the world is getting better. <laughs> now, uh, since the Enlightenment, there has been an ideal of progress, often called uh, a naive belief in progress or a faith in progress. But whether there has been progress or not uh, can be treated as an empirical question. Uh, namely, identify things that most people agree are good, like life and health and knowledge. Uh, we now have organizations that measure them at various points in time, and uh, we can examine, as a matter of fact, have these measures of um, value and well-being increased or decreased over time. And uh, to my surprise, and to most people's shock and often disappointment, uh, most of them have been increasing. And I'm going to just go through 10 of them. First, life itself. Um, I'll, I'll, I won't ask for a show of hands, but um, what is your estimate of the uh, global average human lifespan? Pick a randomly selected person on Earth, any continent, uh, Africa, Asia, how old uh, on average can you expect that person to live? The answer is 70. Uh, most people uh, would uh, give an estimate uh, several decades lower. Uh, this is a radical change from uh, even the recent past, but if we go back to, say, a century and a half ago, the uh, average human lifespan was 30 years. So today it's 70, and it shows no signs of leveling off. The curves are, uh, are going upward. Uh, second, health. Another thing that most people agree upon, that uh, uh, not being sick is better than being sick. Well, here's a couple of examples of progress we've made in health. If you go to Wikipedia and you look up smallpox, or if you look up uh, rinderpest, cattle plague, a disease that decimated herds of, of uh, cattle all over the world, leading to um, massive starvation in large swaths of uh, Africa and Asia, the definitions are in the past tense. Rinderpest was a disease, or cattle plague was a disease. Smallpox was a disease. Namely, they have been eradicated. They no longer exist. Uh, the same may be true. Um, uh, within our lifetimes for uh, polio and guinea worm. And uh, whether or not these diseases are eradicated, they are certainly being decimated. Hookworm, malaria, filariasis, measles, rubella, and yaws. Third, prosperity. Most people would agree that it's uh, better. Uh, as uh, I think it was Sophie Tucker who said, I've been um, uh, rich and unhappy, and I've been poor and unhappy. Rich and unhappy is better. <coughs> Uh, so if rich is better than poor, we can look at global prosperity. So what percentage of the world's population would you estimate lives in extreme poverty? I think there is a, um, a definition, I think it's something like living on a dollar ninety per day. Um, the uh, the uh, answer today is 10% of the world lives in extreme poverty. Uh, two centuries ago, the answer would have been 85%. So we've gone from 85% global poverty to 10% global poverty. And uh, there is a, um, a sustainable development goal, the successor to the UN's Millennium Development Goals, that calls for global poverty to be eradicated by the year 2030. Most of us uh, will be alive uh, at that time, so we could see global poverty eradicated. Uh, fourth, peace. And this is what 
brought me into this uh, set of questions. Uh, the most destructive human activity, war between big, powerful nations, is uh, obsolescent. It's on its way out. <laughs> Developed countries, that is, rich countries that can afford big, rich, destructive armies, have not fought a war against each other in 70 years. The great powers, the 800-pound gorillas on the world's uh, stage, have not fought a war in 60 years, since the end of the Korean War. Now, there are still civil wars, of course. We read about them every day. But civil wars are less destructive than interstate wars. And the annual death rate from all wars com uh, combined has been in bumpy decline since 1946. I estimate that in, during World War II, probably the worst years in, perhaps in human history, uh, the global rate of uh, death in war was about 300 per 100,000. In the 1950s, during the period of the Korean War, it was 22. In the 1970s, it was 9. In the 1980s, it was 8. In the 1990s, it was 1.5. And uh, in the first decade of the 21st century, it was 0 0.2. That is one-fifth of a war death per 100,000 people. Now, we have seen in the last five years the horrific civil war in Syria, and that has uh, tragically uh, reverse the direction of the curve. But if you look at the curve, I'm, I apologize for not having prepared slides for this following Dan's man, mandate of, of uh, presenting kind of newly hatched ideas. The curve kind of looks like that. It goes down. It kind of hits, uh, hugs the floor in the first decade of the um, 21st century. And thanks to the Syrian civil war has gone up a little bit like that. <clears throat> but nowhere near the levels of the uh, 80s, 70s, 60s, uh, or 50s. Uh, it's the Syrian civil war, plus uh, uh, <clears throat> some other ongoing wars, Ukraine, uh, Nigeria, Pakistan, have wiped out, I'd say, about 15 years of the last 70 years of progress. But they have nowhere near brought us back to levels of decades that many of us have lived through. Uh, fifth, safety. Uh, another uh, uh, set of data that, I, uh, that um, led me to ask the current questions, thanks to uh, the, a uh, book I wrote whose subtitle was Why Violence Has Declined. Um, rates of homicide have been falling, most dramatically in uh, the United States and other Western countries, where starting in 1992, the homicide rate fell uh, precipitously for eight years in a row, kind of had a slower decline starting in the uh, first years of the 21st century. Then 2008 happened, the uh, financial crisis, the Great Recession. Everyone thought the crime rate would uh, uh, climb. Uh, it actually went on a second decline after 2008. So now the uh, homicide rate in the United States is about half of what it was at its peak in the 1990s. Um, this set of declines is uh, true of uh, every Western country. And it is true of a lot of the crime hotspots in the developing world. Um, uh, probably many of you have images of uh, ex extraordinarily dangerous cities like uh, Medellin, Colombia, Rio de Janeiro. Many of those Latin American cities have seen reductions of homicide in, on, in the, on the order of 50%, sometimes 80%. Uh, I was at a meeting organized by the World Health Organization and the University of Cambridge last year that uh, calculated that it would, it would be completely feasible to cut, cut the global rate of homicide in half in uh, 30 years. Sixth, freedom. There have been conspicuous regressions in the trend toward democracy in certain countries, in Venezuela, in Turkey, in Russia, uh, in China. But if you calculate uh, the, an index of democracy worldwide, as some organizations do, you actually see that the global democracy index is at an all-time high. The world has never been more democratic than it is now. More than 60% of the world's population now lives in societies that are uh, complete or partially, uh, completely or partially democratic. Uh, seven, knowledge. In 1820, uh, the proportion of the world's population with a basic education was 17%. Uh, today, it is 82%. And the, uh, again, that is going upward. The uh, percentage is heading toward 100. Eight, human rights. Again, there are uh, conspicuous violations of human rights. We read about them uh, every day. And uh, it's harder to quantify progress in, in uh, human rights, unlike, say, homicide or, or literacy. But uh, there are ongoing global campaigns that, uh, that most of the world's nations have signed on to that have targeted child labor, capital punishment, human trafficking, 
violence against women, female genital mutilation, and the criminalization of homosexuality. Uh, in each case, the United Nations has, has uh, passed re resolutions. Now, uh, these are toothless. They are aspirational statements, so you might, might think that they are uh, just sort of feel-good declarations. But if history is a guide, uh, often an um, aspirational statement is the first step in reducing and often abolishing a practice. And we have seen over the last couple of centuries or, or longer the abolition of practice, uh, practices such as human sacrifice, that is throwing a virgin into a volcano to get good weather, uh, cannibalism, uh, widespread infanticide as a form of birth control, chattel slavery, of course, slavery was used to be, uh, a few hundred years ago, slavery was legal in every country on earth. Now it is illegal in every country on earth. For 35 years, there's been no country on earth that allows uh, legal chattel slavery. Uh, burning heretics, um, torture executions as a form of routine punishment, uh, some breaking on the wheel or burning on the stake. Uh, public hangings, uh, debt bondage, dueling among men of honor, uh, harems, eunuchs, freak shows, foot binding, and uh, going out for a nice Sunday afternoon of entertainment by laughing at the mentally ill at the local uh, insane asylum. So all of those practices have been uh, eliminated. Um, it is not uh, romantic or utopian to imagine that the same thing could happen uh, with, say, female gen genital mutilation, beating of spouses, uh, uh, capital punishment and so on. In fact, capital punishment has been on a uh, steady slide, including in the United States, one of the last holdouts among Western democracies. Uh, it is likely that capital punishment in the United States will, uh, will, will uh, cease. And uh, it's always dangerous to extrapolate ongoing trends uh, linearly, but just as a kind of mental exercise, if one were to do that, just extrapolating the current trend, capital punishment will vanish by 2026. Now, I don't think it will, but that's just a, a way of visualizing the direction of the change. Uh, nine, uh, gender equity. Uh, global data, uh, when they exist, show that women uh, worldwide are, are uh, getting better educated, are marrying later, are earning more, and are in more positions of power and influence. Finally, I'll throw this in. Uh, as hard as it may, believe, may be to believe, intelligence is increasing globally, according to a phenomenon called the Flynn Effect. IQ has been increasing by three points a decade uh, throughout the 20th century and all over the world. So um, <clears throat> a couple of questions. Will these trends continue? And the answer is, of course, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't do prophecy. Um, and are there other trends that, are, uh, that, that could make things catastrophically worse? There has been a... Uh, a revival of um, apocalyptic uh, fantasies involving rampaging robots and engulfment by uh, 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 nanobots and gray goo and so on. I think uh, some of these are utterly fanciful. Uh, there are, to be sure, ones that are uh, serious and uh, particularly climate change and the possibility of nuclear war. Uh, will, are we doomed to climate change? Um, I, I, to the catastrophic effects of climate change, I should say. Um, you know, again, I, uh, no one knows. I don't know. Uh, much depends on choices that we make now. Um, actually, I will say that we're not doomed to it because there are uh, roadmaps toward dealing with climate change other than undoing the Industrial Revolution, which uh, is not going to happen and should not happen because the developing world, in order to enjoy all the gains that the first world has enjoyed, is going to have to have a form of uh, affordable energy. Uh, the, uh, Joshua Goldstein and I wrote an op-ed in The Globe in which we argued that if you, are, if you want to be really serious about averting catastrophic climate change, then uh, we need um, a number of things. One of them is carbon pricing, so that uh, in literally millions of decisions, people factor in the choice that minimizes carbon emissions. Second would be um, massive research and development into low carbon energy technologies and energy storage so that uh, sources like intermittent sources like solar and wind uh, have a way of um, distributing the availability energy across uh, uh, different loads. And probably a third would be a, uh, a new generation of uh, nuclear power, which is the most scalable uh, large uh, source of uh, the energy that the world will uh, 
undoubtedly continue to demand indeed in an increasing rate. And that uh, that's actually, I think, an increasing number of environmentalists are coming to agree that there is no way forward to avoiding climate change other than uh, an increase in, uh, in nuclear power, uh, possibly with a new generation of uh, even safer designs. Uh, there's also, uh, and whether, uh, I'll, I'll, just to make it clear, I am not predicting that uh, we will avert catastrophe. I have no idea. Uh, but I, but I, uh, what I would say is that we aren't doomed to uh, catastrophic climate change. There, there is a roadmap that avoids it. Uh, what about um, thermonuclear World War III? Uh, well, um, I was, when I entered graduate school in 1976, we were welcomed with a talk by uh, the computer scientist Joseph Weizenbaum. I think, Dan, you knew him, right? And I'm, uh, he told us what, we, what, what he thought were priorities for our research and training and education. But then he finished by saying, uh, actually, I don't care whether you've listened to me or not. It doesn't really matter what I say, because uh, I, uh, I know with complete confidence, I have the slightest doubt in my mind, that by the year 2000, you'll all be dead. Uh, well, rumors of our death were greatly exaggerated. Uh, and again, I'm not going to uh, predict that there will not be a catastrophic nuclear war. Maybe there will be. Um, but uh, nor do I think it's inevitable. I think it's good to keep in mind that despite predictions such as Joseph Weizenbaum's, which were quite common through the 1970s, that it was just a matter of time, nuclear war was inevitable, there was no way to avoid it. Uh, we have avoided it for uh, 71 years. No nuclear weapon has been used since Nagasaki. The Cold War is over. 16 states have given up nuclear weapons programs, including just uh, this year, Iran. The number of nuclear weapons, seldom recognized fact, has been reduced by more than 80%. And there is a, 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 oh, there was an agreement in 2010, a global agreement that locked down loose nukes and fissile material. And it's even conceivable, again, I don't think this is going, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it's uh, not beyond the realm of possibility that um, the Global Zero Movement to eliminate all nuclear weapons, um, I, I think, is not a fantasy. It was, it's been endorsed by the major uh, US Cold War hawks, that is uh, Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, um, Sam Nunn, and uh, William Perry signed a statement calling for the elimination of all nuclear weapons. And in principle, this was endorsed by world leaders a few years ago. Um, uh, it was one of the reasons that Barack Obama won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Dmitry Medvedev also endorsed it. Unfortunately, uh, there was a, a little regime change in Russia, and uh, his successor uh, has uh, not endorsed it. Well, um, so this leads to a couple of questions. Why, uh, if all of the indicators that we have, and again, this is not a prophecy as to what's going to happen, happen in the future, but it is, I think, an indisputable fact of where we have come uh, to the present compared to the past, and that's something that, that we do know. Why does this run so counter to most people's understanding of the world? I think there are a number of reasons. One is the uh, well-known uh, uh, cognitive biases in uh, assessing risk and uh, probability, documented by Amos Tversky, Daniel Kahneman, and, uh, and many others. In particular, that our sense of probability is uh, largely driven by a cognitive rule of thumb they call the availability heuristic. The more easily you can bring an example to mind, the higher the probability you estimate that uh, class of events to be. So people, uh, when they read about someone getting eaten by a shark, they don't want to get into the water. Uh, when they uh, read of a plane hijacking, they stay away from airplanes. And instead, they drive where they have a uh, far greater chance of being killed. Uh, people don't fear. Um, risks that actually have a pretty good chance of killing them, like falling down the stairs, falling off a ladder, getting poisoned, uh, getting, being the result of a uh, medical error, uh, texting while driving, and so on. And so our sense of danger is disconnected from the objective probabilities. And that is multiplied by the nature of our source of information about the state of the world, namely the news. Most of us don't read 
uh, World Bank annual reports or, or declarations from the World Health Organization, but we, we do follow the news. Uh, news is about stuff that happens, not about stuff that doesn't happen. So if you have a high school that hasn't been shot up, you don't have a reporter outside it saying, here I am live at the scene of um, Middlebury High School, which has not had a rampage shooter today. Uh, or here I am at the capital of uh, Mozambique and the Civil War, uh, which killed almost a million people, has not broken out for yet another year. Uh, a second reason is that there's a, a phenomenon in, known to personality psychology that uh, we tend to confuse changes in ourselves with changes in the times. Uh, as we get older, we become more aware of uh, dangers and follies that have been there all along. And so uh, every generation is nostalgic for the good old days. Uh, another is that um, everyone's a social critic. Uh, I, there's a kind of, uh, it's another phenomenon documented by social psychologists, like uh, Teresa Amabile, is that um, pessimists get greater respect than optimists. Uh, this is, uh, there is a veneer of sophistication if you're a pessimist, if you are, uh, say anything optimistic that is uh, perceived as naive, simplistic, uh, out of touch. Uh, and as uh, Thomas Hobbes observed, competition of praise inclineth to a reverence of antiquity, for men contend with the living, not with the dead. Uh, and the disconnect between people's impressions and uh, reality uh, can actually be quantified. The epidemiologist Hans Rosling, many of you I'm sure have seen his TED Talks, gave 1,000 people a set of multiple choice questions on uh, some of the data that I have summarized uh, this evening. Uh, population, literacy, life expectancy, poverty. And uh, I will quote him. I said, if for each question I wrote the alternatives on bananas and asked chimpanzees in the zoo to pick the right answers, they would have done better than the respondents. <laughs> <laughs> the reason being that in every single case, the respondents were too pessimistic. Well, the other question is, uh, why has this uh, happened? Why have we enjoyed the progress that, that we have? I don't believe in any mysterious arc bending toward justice. It's a lovely figure of speech from Reverend, uh, Reverend Thomas Parkman, taken up by Martin Luther King. I don't think there's any uh, Hegelian dialectic or end of history. Um, so we have to look at, at what are plausible uh, causal processes that have led to improvements. One of them has been clearly the, the rise of certain human institutions that, have, that make up for some of our cognitive and moral shortcomings and allow uh, groups of people, societies, to accomplish what people acting as individuals could not. Government, obviously, being one of them, as I think Tom, Thomas Hobbes was right, that uh, it's a, a good thing to have a, uh, a leviathan that keeps people from each other's throats, because the, a disinterested third party uh, can mete out justice, can um, uh, deter uh, um, exploitative aggression better than individuals uh, threatening each other in duels or uh, pursuing vendettas, because in any moral dispute, both sides are absolutely convinced that they are in the right and that their aggression consists of justified uh, retaliation after the fact, whereas the other guy's uh, aggression is uh, unprovoked uh, aggression out of the blue. If you have both people caught up in these, both sides caught up in these self-serving biases, you have the uh, recipe for endless blood feuds and cycles of uh, vendetta, something that could be nipped in the bud if you've got a disinterested third party beating out the punishment. We obviously have that within effective uh, societies, that is, ones that are not failed states in, in terms of a judiciary system and a uh, police force. We don't have the equivalent in the international arena. Of course, there's no global leviathan, but there has been evolving a set of um, international norms, expectations, uh, ad hoc coalitions of, of uh, peacekeeping forces that have, on average, done more uh, good than harm. Uh, even though the United Nations peacekeeping forces have not always kept the peace, uh, they keep it more often than, than, than not, and uh, civil wars that do bring in peacekeepers have a lower rate of recidivism than, th than those that don't. Also, the United Nations, um, with the formation of the United Nations, there was the advent of a, a, a quite a radical change in norms in the global system. Uh, no United Nations uh, member has ever gone out of existence through conquest. Uh, quite remarkable compared to previous uh, 
history in which you know, Poland would get wiped off the map and sw countries would get swallowed up. Uh, and there's been very little, since 1945, uh, very little uh, conquest of territory by uh, one country by another. The, certainly the annexation of Crimea the year before last is a disturbing uh, exception. But uh, by and large, borders have gotten grandfathered in. And even when states have broken up, the uh, internal uh, divisions of provinces become, or state, states become new divisions between uh, nations. And the age-old process of moving borders around by force, swallowing neighboring weaker countries, uh, seems to be on the way out because of this global norm regime. Uh, and then, of course, other institutions, uh, universities, um, uh, intergovernmental organizations like the World Health Organization uh, that uh, encourage cooperation and uh, retention and propagation of best practices on a national or global scale means that when there are solutions that work, you uh, are more likely to remember them. Uh, if there are solutions that require cooperation among larger groups of entities, then the, the means is available to, to uh, do them. Uh, other institutions like um, the uh, institutions that make market exchange possible have certainly deserve a large part of the credit for the growth of affluence. The fact that China and India switched to market economies with their uh, close to two billion people uh, by itself uh, uh, is responsible for a, a large part, although not all, of the growth in those statistics. Um, not all because African and Asian countries also, uh, other Asian countries have also uh, increased, but certainly two billion people is gonna make a big dent and, and uh, that certainly helped. But then what about why, would, uh, th these are ways in which, oh, and, and of course the advancement of science is directly responsible for a number of these advancements, most conspicuously in the case of uh, disease, measure, public health measures and um, measures of, uh, of medical care have uh, decimated rates of death uh, another, some other statistics that I uh, didn't mention, but that are kind of subsumed in the ones that I did mention, is that infant mortality is way down, uh, maternal mortality is, uh, is way down. Uh, but this then leads to the question of why have these institutions uh, led to uh, what I think we would all agree are moral advances, that is, uh, uh, greater freedom, greater um, uh, life, greater health. And uh, here I'll, I'll just speculate, because um, again, I don't believe in any mystical uh, arc bending toward justice. But um, I think there, there may be a, uh, a dynamic where as you uh, broaden the circle of, of discourse, as you have to def set out goals and defend practices among larger and larger groups of people, that pushes the uh, values that you can promote in a, uh, in a in a certain direction. First of all, just having to justify certain practices as opposed to carrying them on by either societal inertia or uh, primitive human motives like tribalism and uh, purity and uh, conformity. Once you put a practice into the harsh light of reason, then uh, certain practices will, will uh, crumble. I think that happened with, uh, that's what got the campaign to abolish slavery started, that you just could not uh, come up with a uh, viable argument for why slavery uh, uh, sh should be practiced. And more recently, uh, a number of commentators have noticed that the um, uh, institutionalized um, uh, oppression of gay people uh, has crumbled precipitously quickly, that uh, it, uh, private homosexual activity used to be uh, a criminal offense in most American states. Uh, state after state has decriminalized homosexuality, and in 2004, a Supreme Court decision declared it unconstitutional. Even more quickly, uh, gay marriage has become uh, acceptable across the country and in an increasing number of countries. And if you actually look at the distribution across the, uh, demographically, across the age scale, uh, younger people are totally baffled and mystified as to why, not only why people should be hope, uh, uh, homophobic now, but why homophobia ever existed. It just does not, uh, uh, does not compute. And I think what we're seeing there is that if you have to, there, there, we can imagine a number of primitive responses to 
uh, homosexuality among heterosexual people. But if you actually had to make the case as to uh, uh, why someone should be thrown in jail for having uh, homosexual sex, it's uh, what the automatic, automatic reaction of uh, younger people would be and, and uh, more liberal people would be, well, if it doesn't hurt anyone, then it can't be wrong. Uh, that is what happens amongst consenting uh, adults can't be uh, immoral. Then as that kind of justification is, uh, expands to larger and larger circles, ultimately global forums, then uh, I, th I think it does push in the direction of what a lot of us would, be, would consider um, uh, defensible moral values. Uh, this could happen both in the emotional realm in terms of who we empathize with, that it is harder to restrict your circle of concern to your own tribe when you see uh, heart-rending pictures of uh, suffering of other people, and as we become more just viscerally aware of the state of the rest of the world, that may have a, a, uh, an effect on expanding our circle of empathy. But also uh, for our, at the um, intellectual uh, level, um, that is, uh, if you have to defend something that everyone agrees to sign on to, and the people that with whom you are having those negotiations are not from your tribe, your country, and so on, uh, there are a lot of things that are just ruled out. So imagine the negotiations for the United Nations, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the late 1940s. Let's say uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was one of the people spearheading that movement, said, well, the first article in the Declaration of Human Rights is that we should all accept Jesus Christ as our savior. Well, you know, that wouldn't have flown in, you know, in India and Japan and Israel and so on. So that's kind of a non-starter. Uh, likewise, imagine now that um, we were to have a uh, United Nations uh, resolution on making America great. Well, it's hard to imagine that France would sign on to that, for example. So once you have to make your case beyond your tribe, once you have to make your case to other rational, sentient agents, there are uh, certain values that you can argue for, namely, if you are arguing in the first place, if you are trying to persuade, if you're trying to convince, uh, that almost by definition you have signed on to reason, to rationality, to uh, evidence, to correct versus incorrect facts. The uh, mere fact that you are there and alive and making the case uh, presupposes that being alive and being able to make a case is better than being dead or being sick or disabled. And so universal values like reason, like life, like uh, uh, health, like happiness, like knowledge, uh, I think are the natural, I don't want to call it the residue, but it's certainly the common ground when you are coming to uh, agreement for your, even for your own benefit that depends on the cooperation of other people. And the wider the circle, the more the pressure is going to be toward uh, what we would recognize as universal human values as opposed to parochial tribal ones, which you could perhaps get away with when it was just your little tribal circle, but which will crumble when you have to make the case more globally. Anyway, that is just a, a, a speculation as to the why, uh, but um, I think it is a, 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 a underappreciated yet important uh, uh, point that we uh, acknowledge the, the that, the fact that there has been uh, progress. Uh, among the implications are that not everything we've been doing is wrong, that there are uh, some things that are well worth preserving, and that any argument that says that uh, the current state of the world is so catastrophic that we need to tear down all our institutions because nothing could be worse, uh, we are heading toward disaster, we need a a savior, we need to tear things down just because anything that rises from its ashes will be better than what we have now uh, are dangerously mistaken, factually and morally. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And now we'll get to some questions. Uh, thanks. That was great and uplifting, finally. Um, I have two sort of questions comments. Um, the first is about media, and I think you're totally right, the sort of if it bleeds, it leads thing makes us crazy. But I also wonder if you agree that the flip side is also relevant. That is, we find out about things much more quickly. That some, sometimes stops things in their tracks because we've got you know, people videotaping it, those sorts of things. So the sort of positive role that, that more information produces. 
And the other question that uh, I the have... The answer is absolutely yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So that's easy. Yeah, uh, for sure. And the other question is, I completely agree with you. Um, and I, I've always said that, you know, the Tea Party and the similar things are really just the last gasp of white supremacy. But a lot of other people say, no, they think there's a backlash to exactly this there is one way to have morals, there is one way to have reason, and that some of what we're seeing is this resistance to a universalized ethic. And I just wonder what your response to that would be. Yeah, the resistance there, there clearly is. Um, and uh, although, um, and, and I think it, the, the resistance is, uh, you know, is natural in the sense that uh, we are always, always are and always will be, uh, in danger of regressing to some of the, I, I think, evolved human reactions, uh, such as tribalism, such as purity, such as deference to authority, such as conformity to a norm, all of which moral psychologists have shown are very easily uh, moralized. I think a lot of the great advance in, uh, in the human condition comes from uh, contracting the moral sense, so that a lot of things that we used to think were morally um, uh, condemnable are just now outside the sphere. That is, we're becoming more utilitarian. We're becoming uh, less likely to moralize heresy and um, uh, insubordination and criticizing those in authority. But that, that tendency will always uh, be there. Uh, I think our better institutions uh, pull us away from them, but, but there'll, there'll always be some tendency to, to backslide. I mean, it, but on the other hand, in the global direction, like not paying attention to what happened on the Super Tuesday primary as a harbinger of things to come. I mean, even though I, I, I vowed not to bring up uh, Donald Trump, but um, <laughs> just because it's the black hole of conversation. But uh, as, as terrifying as that phenomenon is, and, you know, and I am terrified, but remember, it's, it's about um, a third of uh, Republicans. Uh, Republicans have lost the popular vote for president in five out of the last six elections. Uh, a lot of issues that, uh, that uh, used to be considered um, liberal are now consensus among conservatives. You do not, no longer have arguments, uh, even from the right, about uh, racial segregation, keeping women out of the workforce, keeping women out of the, the military, uh, uh, and so on. So, and one of the reasons I think that the uh, American right, uh, why there are so many angry white men, is that they do feel the consensus slipping out from, from under them because the, the world, at least the, certainly the Western world, uh, has gotten more, at least classically, liberal. So um, again, uh, this is not to say, not to prophecy that, uh, that bad things won't happen, bad things might happen. But, uh, but I don't think the events that we read about today are, should be seen as harbingers or as trends, necessarily. OK, David. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So another measure of progress is, you know, how many hot showers and baths you have. And King John of England, it's known from the records, had two hot baths a year, and he was, uh, he was king. But the, the, the issue in prosperity, uh, and, and I'm going back to Veblen now, is very much how you're doing relative to other people. And so the, the poor in America, in many you know, in terms of hot baths, are living better than King John did in the, the Middle Ages. But Veblen argued that our sense of value and how we're doing is not in absolute terms, but in the invidious comparisons to other and relative to other people. And you know, a lot of the anger that you're seeing in the electorate is in that people are seeing other people doing um, better than them. So in absolute terms, things are getting better. And so, you know, do you have, first of all, long-term trends on income equality distribution and how do sense of well-being correlate with um, sense of inequality? Yeah, the, uh, I think it is wise to, to uh, distinguish inequality from poverty. Uh, I would certainly argue, argue on moral grounds that uh, that inequality is trivial compared to poverty. That is, um, if your child doesn't die, uh, if your spouse doesn't die, if you don't die, uh, if you are literate as opposed to illiterate, uh, if you can uh, afford to read after dinner, if you can afford light, uh, which of course for most human, uh, human history people couldn't, um, 
that is uh, much more important than if someone at the other end of town has a bigger house as opposed to a much bigger house as opposed to a much, much, much bigger house. Now, granted, we do have envy. It is a, can be a powerful emotion. Uh, it can't be uh, discounted as a, as a source of, of uh, resentment and, and uh, dissatisfaction, and, and I think you're right that we are seeing it. But in the, in the grand scheme of things, um, uh, if there is a choice between keeping uh, everyone in um, uh, abject poverty and early death and children dropping like flies versus giving everyone a decent standard of living, but then there will be some ultra-rich. I think the, the second one is, is uh, to be uh, clearly to be uh, preferred, which isn't to say that there, that there shouldn't also be a, uh, some concern with inequality, but in the global scheme of things, it's much less important than uh, alleviating poverty, especially globally, especially when we're talking about, say, living to 70 as opposed to living to 30, uh, being literate as opposed to being illiterate, being in a war zone as opposed to being in peace, and, and so on. Now, Steve, before we take another question, I'm going to uh, assert my right as the uh, host to, to make a point, which at lunch we were talking about what you were going to talk about, and one of your other choices was mutual knowledge or, or, or common knowledge. And uh, following up Cheryl's point about the role of the media, I think that we should take heart from the fact that with the huge expansion of electronic media. Uh, it's very much harder to keep a secret these days. Moreover, it's very easy to get mutual knowledge out there. Um, uh, an example I've used, which will maybe inflame some people here, is uh, 50 years ago, there were thousands of priests that had abused children, and there were thousands of people that knew that a priest had abused a child. Today, there are thousands of priests who have abused children, and there are hundreds of millions of people who know that this is true, and who know that everybody else knows it. And that mutual knowledge, that common knowledge, has a huge effect on, for instance, recruitment into the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church because you walk down the street and you know that everybody knows and so forth. And I think this is a huge effect in the world. I wonder if you agree. No, it is a, an enormously positive effect. and It's both cause and consequence of our expanding moral circle. Uh, another example of a, a relatively recent moral concern is bullying. Uh, it used, uh, used to be that bullying was just you know, part of childhood. Boys will be boys. Uh, you, don't, uh, you don't want to reduce bullying because then you'll have a, you know, boys growing up to be sissies and you know, panty, panty waists and how are they going to get tough. If, uh, and now bullying is considered a moral abomination. The President of the United States gave a speech on bullying. That would have been kind of a, a joke when, when, uh, when, when I was a child. Uh, and rates of bullying have gone down as a consequence uh, of, of the <coughs> widespread concern. I think this is an advance. I don't think we're in danger of having a generation of sissies. I think children who are bullied clearly suffer. I think it's good that we're eliminating it. But the, uh, the paradox, though, is that the increased awareness and concern with bullying also sometimes lead to a misperception that bullying has increased because we notice it more. Um, so I, uh, so that, that's why uh, I agree with both of you that, uh, in general, the increased media um, attention to suffering worldwide and in some of the um, hidden corners of our own society is, is quite clearly a good thing. Uh, I think it does have to be uh, mixed with some appreciation of uh, more uh, of longer-term trends, simply because we just know that uh, in individual incidents can be misleading as a picture of the way the world is going because of the availability heuristic, and also just because, as any you know, historians, don't just give you a story based on uh, you know, individual headlines; they put together a, a larger picture, and, and, and so should we. Because precisely because I think there, it is quite corrosive if people believe that uh, the world is falling apart; um, that if there is why pessimism can turn into uh, fatalism 
and into uh, the, uh, uh, the, the craving for some kind of charismatic savior or to a um, willingness to tear down institutions under the uh, assumption that anything must be better than what we have now and that it doesn't matter how much chaos will, the revolution will bring, something more uh, better will rise from its ashes. That, uh, you know, I think we've seen that that happen sometimes in history and it hasn't been a, a pretty picture. Uh, I think we're seeing it on a small scale in some of the, in both in Europe and in the United States in the fact that, that some um, kind of revanchist uh, movements, xenophobic, uh, reactionary, have uh, gotten uh, um, uh, traction, largely because of the, the uh, belief that things are getting worse and worse and that nothing could be worse than what we have now. And of course, things could be a lot worse. Okay. Um, so um, I think the uh, Peter Singer expanding circle theory, it's, it's very compelling. I, I hope it's true. Um, yet from another perspective, right, tribalism just seems to be rampant. Um, and one could cite many, many examples, but one would be the to the refugee crisis in Europe. And I think that could make one very, very pessimistic that our allegiances have really expanded that much. Well, it, it depends on how you look at it. The, the Syrian ref, refugee crisis is quite extraordinary. And it's extraordinary um, both because of the, uh, how sudden it, 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 it was. I mean, that, that, that kind of massive influx of people uh, is a, a very unusual event, and it's one that, of course, was facilitated by uh, communications revolutions such as uh, cell phones. Um, it has to be, uh, so I think it would be, it's not clear that if there's the equivalent of the Syrian refugee crisis in the magnitude that it was taken, that it would be better, it would have been better 30 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago. I suspect it would not have been, uh, particularly since uh, it is mixed with the um, the, the fear, again, uh, kind of enhanced by media coverage, that some percentage of the, uh, of the refugees will themselves be fomenters of violence. What, what happened in Cologne with the uh, women being sexually uh, assaulted by groups of immigrants, even if that, of course, it's a, a small percentage, but that is enough on people's minds that it could, uh, because of uh, media coverage, uh, because of uh, the, the fact that, again, terrorism is a, another example of a misperception of the actual risk, almost by definition. But the fact that the fear of terrorism re, uh, results in some skittishness of accepting a, a million uh, refugees, it, even if it's not justifiable, it is uh, at least explicable. And it's not clear that it would have been any better if the circumstances have been, have been uh, uh, replicated uh, in the past. So the fact that you do have Germany accepting, I think it's up to now a million Syrian refugees, is actually quite extraordinary, I think, by historical Even with the resistance, the, uh, given the extraordinary nature of this particular event and, uh, and, and what has happened, uh, it doesn't seem to me to be a, re a regression, that we just don't have a comparison of the same circ extraordinary circumstances in, in uh, past years. But this is not to deny that there is a lot of I think that tri tribalism is a uh, default reaction, and, uh, and there's always a danger of, uh, of backsliding, and again, as we see in our own country. Stephen, um, first I want to back you, support you in every way I can on the speculation at the end. I thought it was totally on the mark. But having said that, I want to raise a slight, at least a question. Many of your statistics were per capita. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the world population before and after fixation of nitrogen, in effect, the first decade of the 20th century, it looks like the uh, carbon dioxide curve. It's a hockey stick. The population of the world has been going up more than, you know, exponentially. Meanwhile, there's every reason to think the incidence rates in many of the things you listed are also going up, but less than exponentially. So the question is a two-part question. Maybe some of those statistics are being made to look much better than they would otherwise because of the extraordinary increase in population. And of course, 
the extraordinary increase in population is raising serious long-term worries. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, for uh, every, every time a new baby is born, that is another potential murder victim and another potential murderer and another potential rapist and another potential rape victim. So per capita uh, incidence is the, is the correct way of assessing. The, uh, because if the population had increased and the number of uh, homicides had stayed the same, that would be extraordinary and it would call for an explanation. How come all those people are growing up not to be murderers, unlike previous generations? Um, also, a number of them actually, war deaths, for example, if they're expressed in absolute terms as opposed to per capita, the curve looks pretty much the same. It's the, the tilt is a little bit different, but, uh, but you probably wouldn't even notice the difference eyeballing it. And that's because wars range over orders of magnitude. They're power law distributed like, uh, like vocabulary. Um, so the difference between a war that kills, say, 50 million people, 5 million people, 500,000, 50,000, 5,000, you know, 50. Uh, if world, you divide it by world, by population or not, um, the overall trend is going to be the same or, or very similar. So actually, that doesn't depend. Uh, war deaths don't depend that much on uh, world population. But for everything else, uh, it would, um, uh, the uh, incidence is the relevant uh, way of assessing the tendency or the trend. Uh, otherwise, you would, uh, all, you would look at the increase in population, you'd say everything by definition is getting worse. You wouldn't even have to look at the, uh, any facts. You wouldn't have to look at murders or rapes or illness or anything. You'd just say things are getting worse by definition because there are more people, so there are more opportunities for bad things to happen. So I just don't think it's a defensible way of assessing the uh, prevalence of violence or, or other factors, like infant mortality, for example. If there are more people, they're all else being equal, there are going to be more uh, children who die in the first year of life. Uh, but if the proportion goes down, then, then that is progress, even if there are more uh, opportunities. I mean, you could have a moral argument as to, is it better for people to be brought into existence only to die? Uh, how do you compare that with all the people who are brought into existence who lead a happy life? Mm -hmm. That I'm not, I'm not gonna get into that philosophical issue. But just in terms of our own assessment of whether there's been improvement or not, then uh, I think per capita is the, the uh, sensible way to do it. It's just like you wouldn't, if you were choosing a hospital to go and you didn't want to, you wanted to minimize your chance of, say, a post-surgical infection, you wouldn't choose the smallest hospital in the country because they have the fewest number of complications. You look at the one with the lowest rate. You, you in many respects, uh, uh, distorted point I was making. I was not challenging using per capita statistics. I was worried about bias being built into those statistics because of the extraordinary expansion of population that is continuing at a rate unheard of in human history. Well, the, um, uh, you mean the, the increase in population itself will bring uh, as a result all those extra mouths to feed? I'm saying or Say the rate, well, in the long run, obviously, but that's a different issue. I'm simply asking whether there's some bias in the statistics arising from the extraordinary rate of growth of the world population over the last 110 years. Um, I, I don't see how there would be a bias, um, although there, there, of course, were Malthusian predictions in the 1960s that uh, there would be uh, global famines killing tens of millions of people, and the exact opposite happened. And also, of course, uh, although again, we, you, you can't prophesy the future, but the projections for population show it le leveling off, uh, probably by the, perhaps by the middle of, of the century, perhaps by the end. But there have been population collapses, first in the, of course, in the developed world, where the, the problem now is, is even population contracting, uh, and certainly leveling off. But um, as people get richer, have fewer babies, and uh, the, the, the demographic transition. And we're starting to see that happen in parts of the world that, uh, that, that have um, increased in afflu affluence. And also, for cultural reasons that no one quite understands. So the great exception to the demographic transition until the last five years or so was in the Islamic world, where there were sky-high birth rates. Uh, just recently, they've leveled off, and no one really knows why, uh, probably having to do with the empowerment of women, that when women have more 
choices over when they get married, whether they have access to contraception, whether they can be educated, they tend to have fewer babies. But, uh, but, but even, even in population, I don't think it's, it, the, the predictions that I've seen do not predict that it's just going to keep going up exponentially. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate your, your emphasis on, on positive aspects, uh, taking a historical trajectory. Um, however, I think there are some problems uh, looking at uh, some of the details of, of your argument, like with um, slavery. Um, I think uh, that you overstated the, the role of, of reason and rationality in um, the end of the slave trade and underplayed uh, affect and building, as you said, kind of like larger circles of, of community. So that like uh, when, you, when you talk about um, things that have made positive change, you, you mentioned an enormous number of institutions. So um, you, you didn't you know, mention uh, religion. And I think religion and government and, and a lot of the other things um, have uh, contributed insofar as they have been um, uh, vehicles for balancing forces, uh, bringing about kind of reason uh, discourse or facilitating reason discourse, and by cultivating um, affect. So like with the, the slave trade, um, it wasn't just people saying, you know, slavery is a bad thing. Certainly there was that, but it was also people being confronted with the horrors of slavery and you know, saying, you know, uh, contrary to kind of a, a really gross kind of tribalism, that hey, there's kind of, uh, community and connection. Uh, I can expand my understanding of, of tribe. And so I think th those kinds of things, in whatever organization you, you see it, those kinds of things, um, are important to telling the story of uh, why positive things exist, but you know it also reveals how you know there can be uh, problems, kind of with you know historical specifics, and you know like drilling down and talking about well what were the forces at play in the end of the slave trade, you know over a number of years, what kind of actors, what were their motivations, what kind of legislation, and you know like with the Civil War. You know, it was in fact war that brought about the end of slavery, not merely um, kind of a, a, an argument for the end of slavery. So, just kind of your thoughts on kind of the relationship between you know affect uh, and uh, reason in, in these kind of positive examples of organizations. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, uh, no, that's an important point, and uh, you know, it's hard to apportion how much was due to reason. But you're certainly right that affect had a huge role in, in um, uh, examples like the uh, popularity of Uncle Tom's Cabin as a vivid depiction of the suffering under slavery, Frederick Douglass's uh, autobiography, um, first person accounts of what it was like to be a slave clearly did push um, people uh, away from embracing slavery in the same way that uh, vivid media coverage of suffering in parts of the world today that we might not otherwise have noticed tugs at people's emotions in a, in a positive way. Um, of course, in the United States, it did take a, a, a war, although it didn't uh, in other countries. Uh, Europe managed to, uh, and the British Empire, abolish slavery without a, a, a civil war. And but yes. And common cause between religious people and non-religious people on uh, some of these fronts. Some, some religions, uh, not all. The slaveholders and the Confederates were all religious people as well. Right, what I'm but saying it was, is, uh, But certain religions, like Quakerism, Quakerism certainly were. Uh, yeah, but then again, some Methodists were. My point is, like, insofar as you see with a, an institution um, efforts to, to build common ground, to cultivate uh, affect, to balance forces, those kinds of things can move. So, so just like you, with government, you can see, you know, with totalitarian and fascist regimes, you know, those are bad forms of government, just like you have bad forms of religion. Yeah, no, that, that, that's clearly right. I mean, the, so I think that one can't generalize about religion across the board because religion was on all sides. But, uh, but religion, religious institutions, as opposed to specifically theological beliefs, can be a kind of uh, a crucible for the, the um, 
enhancement of certain moral values. You, and you know, there were arguments that slavery wasn't Christian uh, in, in trip feeding your, your, your uh, fellow people uh, with the charity and respect and, 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 uh, and so on. Uh, so I think the, uh, I mean, religion would be a whole other discussion. I think religion changes uh, as part of this general current. Uh, that is, as um, that there's been a tendency uh, in large parts of the world, though not everywhere, for religions to become more humanistic, more ecumenical, more liberal, uh, and uh, just because religions can't resist the tide that also is pushing uh, other human institutions. In their drive tide. Yes. Steve, I want one more question, and I think Nancy's been waiting oh, yes, for yes, quite a while. Right. Yeah, so, so, so last uh, question. Anyway. That was fascinating and, so, and, and uplifting. So thank you, thank you for that talk. That was, that was wonderful. Um, but I want to go back to David's question about inequality because I think you didn't exactly answer it. So two things. One is, you know, of course, yeah, I, I get your point that uh, poverty matters more than inequality, but it depends on the degree of inequality, right? So if all of those gains were made by, say, the top 10% of the population then they're not as rosy as it looks. So, so two things. One, has inequality been going up? And two, what do, what do all those trends look like if you look at the bottom, say, quarter or half of the population in poverty or any other measure? Globally or in the United States? Globally. Things you were focusing on in your talk. Uh, yeah, no, the- Hard compass. Right. Uh, there, there absolutely has been an increase in inequality, but there's also been a huge reduction in poverty. Uh, most dramatically in the case of uh, the, uh, the global poverty line, where it's gone from 85% to 10%. Um, so it's, it, is, it is not, uh, globally, it is not an increase at the, just at the top end. No, because of course that would be a, a bad thing. But, but uh, the, in fact, the globally, in the, United, in, in the United States in particular, and in Western countries in general, the rich have been getting richer pa faster than the poor have been getting richer. Globally, it's the other way. The poor have been getting richer faster than the rich have been getting richer. So within countries, inequality has increased. Across countries and globally, inequality has decreased. Just because there were so many people who were so miserably poor that when they get uplifted, that makes a, a, a huge difference for the, the global uh, rate. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody. I I don't know if, is Tony Monaco still here? Yes. I want to thank President Monaco and, the, and Tufts University for sponsoring this event. I am honored that Tufts would basically treat me to this wonderful day with all these smart, wonderful people here. I uh, have been thrilled, as I've said to several people, I make a lousy MC because I just want to get in the discussion and talk and don't want to look at my watch. Uh, so I, I probably should never do this again. <laughs> but uh, now I am the only thing standing between you and drinks and supper. And I do want to remind you that uh, we want to uh, get ourselves over the top of the hill and down to the uh, auditorium where the concert will be by about quarter to eight. And it's about a 50. Hmm? They should start, a, start going at 730. So uh, uh, we can continue the discussion over drinks and dinner. Uh, I want to thank everybody for all their contributions to this amazing afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>